Hey, JT here. Thanks a bunch for joining me. Great to be back with you. Just this week, Apple announced the M1 Ultra, the fourth and final member in Apple's M1 chip family. I've been analyzing the tech sector for 40 years now, and so I have a bit of historical perspective in which to make some judgments on what I think we're seeing right now and what it means for the future. Now, before I get into that, let me give you a bit of background to help you see where we've come from and where we're going based on recent developments. When the Apple Macintosh hit the market, I was there the very first day. As a matter of fact, I was able to see the Apple Macintosh before it debuted. And then I was there on the very first day, the first Mac went on sale in 1984. And it was a groundbreaking development. The Apple Macintosh marked a change in the overall trajectory of the computer industry. Up to that point, we basically had the Intel x86 platform to work with. The innovation coming out of Intel was quite slow. But whenever Motorola released the 68000 processor, it offered just a whole different level of breakthrough in the way computer chips were designed. There was so much more graphic capabilities. It opened the door for what could be done with a computer. Shortly after Apple released the Macintosh, Commodore came out with the Amiga 1000 based on the same processor as the Mac. These two innovative machines competed in the emerging personal computer space based on the same Motorola 68000 processor. And really the Commodore Amiga leapfrogged the Macintosh. It was far superior in a lot of ways. And there for a number of years, it looked like either Apple or Commodore could take the lead in the personal computing world. And we really didn't know which would come out ahead. I used the Macintosh and the Commodore Amiga and really the Commodore Amiga was just way out ahead in many areas. But it turned out that Steve Jobs was much better at marketing. Commodore could not market its way out of a wet paper bag. Apple began focusing their sales in the educational system, getting students learning on a Macintosh that really helped shift a lot of momentum toward Apple. Eventually, Commodore went bankrupt. They just could not compete with Apple and their marketing savvy. As innovative as the Motorola 68000 processor was, Motorola just couldn't keep pace with the demand for that innovation. They fell behind the curve. And before you know it, even though there was a, a Model 10 and a 20 and 30 and such, the demand of the market was outgrowing the pace that Motorola could sustain. Apple found themselves being constrained in their ability to innovate by the chip manufacturer, Motorola in this case. In 1994, Apple announced it was switching from the Motorola processor to form an alliance between Apple, IBM, and Motorola that became known as the AIM Alliance. What came out of that alliance is a new chip design based on a RISC architecture, that's reduced instruction set computer instead of a CISC or complex instruction set computer. And you'll notice over time, Apple has flip-flopped each time between CISC and RISC based processors. That alliance was also known as the PowerPC Alliance because the PowerPC is the primary product that came out of the AIM Alliance. From my perspective, designing computer chips by committee, having Apple, IBM, and Motorola, all three involved in the process of architecting, designing, and building chipsets naturally slowed its pace of innovation. And once again, Apple was constrained in its ability to deliver new, fresh, innovative products due to its chip manufacturer. As the years went by, it became increasingly clear that the AIM Alliance couldn't keep pace with the demands of the market. In 2006, Apple announced it was moving off the PowerPC platform over to Intel and its x86 architecture. I had some pretty significant reservations about that move because historically how Intel makes decisions and prioritizes their chip design is a bit different from how Apple likes to innovate. And it felt a bit like a partnership where two parties were going to have to both give quite a bit to be able to meet each other's needs. I don't think that that move served Apple really well. 
I think there was a lot of hope for those of us who are analyzing the industry to think that, hey, here's an opportunity for Macs and PCs to both run on the same chipset. And I think with held breath, many of us thought, hey, we might see an opportunity emerge here where you could have one piece of hardware that could run a PC and a Mac. Well, just due to competing companies, that never really panned out, and it's understandable. Apple wants to sell hardware. They want to tightly couple their software and hardware together so that they can deliver the ultimate experience to the end user. And if they were to lose control of that hardware and people could run the Mac OS on any hardware they wanted, they couldn't guarantee what that user experience would be like. And so they just weren't willing to take that risk. And so that's quite understandable. But I think we as end users lost out on a big opportunity. Now, granted the Hackintosh community developed and it was possible to run the Mac OS on an Intel-based PC, but required a lot of diligence, finding the right combinations of drivers and such. And for the average person, just the level of pain to do that, the cost of entry was just too high. Like many, I gave up on that dream. And so for a lot of reasons, I think the decision to go with Intel was mixed. Certainly Apple was able to tap into a large manufacturing pool of chips, but Intel tends to innovate in a certain way. They tend to want to throw more cycles, more power into a chipset, but Apple likes to deliver balanced experiences to the end user where you don't have to have a water-cooled system where your heat dissipation strategy doesn't involve huge loud fans they want to find a happy balance between performance and power consumption dealing with the thermal dynamics i was delighted when apple announced in 2020 that they were moving off the intel platform and were going to design and build their own processors. To me, that's a decision that's been a long time coming, and I think it's going to advance Apple forward. Historically, Apple's pace of innovation has been constrained by the chip manufacturer that they were coupled with. Motorola, the AIM consortium of the power of PC, and then Intel. And now that they're designing and building their own chipset, their pace of innovation is going to pick up now that that constraint has been severed between them and a third-party chip manufacturer. And we've already begun to see the results of that. In 2020, the M1 processor was breakthrough. And whenever we saw the development in 2021 of the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, we saw that Apple really is setting a pace that's faster than what they were able to maintain with other chip manufacturers. What we're seeing coming out of Cupertino is that Apple is really setting a new trajectory for themselves. What the M1 Pro and M1 Max were capable of in terms of low power consumption but the ability to ramp up the processing capabilities when that power is needed. When I'm rendering these videos in 4K, those processors ramp up, the fan kicks on, and it really eats through my battery, but that's understandable. I'm doing something where I'm requiring an enormous amount of computing capability, but when I'm word processing, browsing the internet and such, I can run for hours and hours with the fan not running, with it cool to touch. It's just the perfect combination between very usable, long battery life experience versus when I absolutely need that computing power, it can kick in and solve my need. It just has that level of flexibility and diversity I've never seen in a laptop ever on the market. And what we're seeing now with the new generation in 2022, now that we've gotten a look at the new M1 Ultra is again, Apple is just blowing the roof off of its innovation and its pace of change. The design and specifications of the M1 Ultra are through the roof, absolutely a powerhouse of technology that's unrivaled in computing today. The fact that they're building five 
nanometer architecture with 114 billion transistors, they're taking two M1 maxes and connecting those two dies with 10,000 low latency channels running at two and a half terabytes per second of throughput is just phenomenal. In a lot of ways, Apple isn't the first to innovate. There are many things you could look at the Apple Silicon and see that other manufacturers, Intel, AMD, Nvidia, and others have gone ahead of them and made the way. AMD developed a chip fusion, a die fusion technology like that. But what AMD did is they developed a very special processor for high-end applications that was very expensive. But where Apple really innovates is they take a lot of breakthroughs and they bring them all together. They then balance out the requirements so that it provides robust capabilities, but then it's power management, it's heat dissipation are very manageable so that you don't have to have a water-cooled system. You don't have to have huge fans that are making noise constantly to be able to run it. They balance out these dynamics so that the average user has a very pleasant experience and they make it affordable enough that the average consumer can justify much of their innovation. Now granted, a lot of people aren't going to be able to drop four grand on the new Mac Studio, but for four grand, you're getting an unparalleled amount of computing power on a desktop. What we're seeing coming out of Cupertino, these new chip designs, these systems on a chip, SOCs, are really innovating. Apple's pushing the envelope. The neural engine that Apple has built into their own silicon is phenomenal. The capabilities that that's creating for artificial intelligence, for machine learning, is going to fundamentally change computer technology, the capabilities for computers to anticipate things and to be able to fulfill needs in ways that current computers simply can't do. And now that the M1 Ultra is out, I have to say I couldn't be more excited about the future of computing. Apple is demonstrating that now that the cuffs are off their hand, they're in charge of their own destiny with their chip design and manufacture. I think we're going to see a future where Apple is leading the industry again. I think we've seen years where Apple was just way behind the curve, but what Apple is showing us is they're awake, they're alive, they're in the driver's seat, and they're really innovating. They're pushing the pace of change. I'll be curious to see what Intel does, AMD, NVIDIA, and other chip manufacturers do in response. I hope they decide, hey, we're gonna keep pace, we're gonna push the envelope, we're going to compete, we're gonna show new concepts to keep pace with Apple and to hopefully even try to surpass them. I think we are all gonna be beneficiaries of these developments in the years ahead. Well, those are a few of my thoughts. Love to know what you think. What have you experienced? What are your thoughts about the M1, about Apple Silicon, particularly the M1 Ultra. Are you going to be purchasing a Mac Studio with that M1 Ultra? I've got to tell you, in terms of bang for your buck, you're going to get a lot, an enormous amount of computing capabilities for $39.99. That's going to blow the doors off of people who have high computational needs, and it will be able to fit on a 7.7 .7 square footprint on their desktop. Phenomenal. Love to know what your thoughts are. Do you have any questions? I'd love to answer those. Drop those in the comment section below. I'll be glad to interact with you and answer all of the questions that you submit in the comment section below. Hey, thanks very much for watching. Appreciate it. If you have any thoughts for future broadcast areas that you'd like for me to cover, leave those in the comment section below. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, spread the love. Mm -hmm.